because uh, I think it sort of reflects what I think we're going to be talking about. And uh, there's a sort of responsibility this, on um, us as Quaker businesses. This um, uh, quote from Quaker 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 really started to care and think about what the environment and what our impact as businesses maybe, as people have upon the world and for the future. And I, and I sort of really think it echoes what I put, truly believe, and I think my board of Quakers, my board of Quakers, my board of directors who are all Quakers, really starting to rethink about what it is, and particularly now in, in, in this pandemic. Um, so we have a heritage, friends. Um, we, we all know our heritage and our heritage is, is very well known in, in Quakers and in business. But uh, it's sort of, you know, the likes of Crow, Crow Reese and Trowery and Clark set up these sort of pioneering Quaker companies and businesses. And uh, they were sort of really well known for, for their ethical business practices. And um, I guess, in, you know, these are really were rooted in the, in the values of, of Quakers. And, um, and I'm sort of wondering, are they so prevalent today in some of the businesses? And uh, we sort of lost that business um, sense. Um, and I'm not so sure that we, we may have moving more towards faith and action rather than sometimes using ethical business to be to portray our business, uh, our business ethics and our, and our, and our faith. And, uh, that we have so, so sort of seem to have forgotten and many friends and I think when you said we talk about the profit word and I think some friends have forgotten that where some of that Quaker fantastic heritage and pioneering ways of doing business and thinking about their people um, have, have were so it's so all think we need to think about that Ken so I think that it also thinks about where these rooted in values and I think as a, as a Quaker enterprise that's really truly what we believe I think um, that our values are our roots and that's really key to the decisions that we make so i think we so what we what we've been doing as a company has been always working with our staff to think through how do we make these values live in today's business world and uh, in about 2015 we sort of consulted um our staff in, in a series of, of I think conversations um, about what it was that they wanted their company the company to be um, going forward um, and, and they sort of made these sets of, um, of commitments uh, into sort of set out their vision and we called it the friendly way um, and you can see the sort of circle that it sort of created you know so how we treat our customers is how we want to treat our staff which reflects what we do as a business in the community. And, and with the great thing about Quakers is making sure that we treat people fairly like our suppliers, because they're and particularly in a pandemic, they are so important that they rely on us and we rely on them. So we need to treat them fairly um, and be truthful about and pay people on time. And, and all are really because of this, because you know how we treat ourselves um, is, is rooted about how we how, how I think it's really important that a business is successful. And I think what I've realized is that the staff actually are Quaker brand ambassadors. They are definitely um, speak uh, for what they believe. They aren't Quakers themselves. I would say 90% of my staff are not Quakers, but they are brand ambassadors of Quaker values and the, and the underpinning ones uh, that, that, that pin our faith. So I think what we're looking at at the moment particularly is, you know, we need to rebuild a better world, rebuild it better. Um, and there is a real growing demand for ethical businesses. Um, and we definitely, I think Quakers have a part to play in this going forward. You know, I think if, if Round Trees and Cabaret's were around, I think they might well have been B corporations by now. They may well have rethought the limited. And I, and I have to say, as, friend, as Quaker, the, our company is currently a limited and I sort of feel I don't feel like a limited company I feel like a social enterprise I want to be something different I don't want to have a label limited so I think we need to build back that welcoming pioneering responsibility that our heritage brings and I want us as Quakers to really bring that to the forefront and I think we have such a lot to give 
So I really do believe, and you're going to hear me do this a lot, and I use it a lot at the moment, is putting faith back into business. I think faith-run, Quaker-led businesses are absolutely the way forward, and we need to re-emerge from the dark ages and bring back those the qualities of what we're doing and if, if, if our company and Scott Barter and others are able to do that then we're on the start of, of making people more aware of the Quaker of the Quaker Quakers and the Quaker business method and what all that it stands for. It's very clear to me that the three P's could have been invented by that original statement you know it is about people it is about profit Planet and it is about profit and that profit word does absolutely rub against some friends and I have two people coming up to say oh you're making a profit but it actually it's the my purpose is set up to make a profit but actually what we do with the profit is more important um, and I think it's also about balancing both those three elements when you're making the profit and I sometimes bracket and put purpose actually. So just because I think sometimes people understand that purpose is to make money, um, but it should never be at the, at the detriment of the other two. So activity should not imply negative to people. And we seek to minimise um, the impact upon the environment. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. All of that, for me, shows a sustainable business. So what is it? Oh, Christian. So what does it really mean for us? So in terms of us, you know, we, we believe that people need to be treated well and need to be treated equitably and remuneration of staff is really important to us. Um, and we also believe that people where we work, we need to make sure that although we're a business, we are part of a community, whether it's the local business community or the community up in Cumbria, in Alberston. And it's really important that we involve ourselves as much as possible. I think we've already started to work on aligning our business planning in line with the sustainable development goals. And we are definitely committed to being a low carbon part of a low carbon community and want to work. And obviously we're currently um, always current, constantly monitoring an impact uh, on the environment. And, you know, last year we dropped it 22%. Uh, and, and there are lots of ways. That, so we are really constantly thinking that's important. And I talk about the profit purpose. Being sustainable pays off. Actually, I think if you've got a really strong brand and you're recognised, and I do believe that the Quaker brand actually makes that really important because it's about the trust. Um, we gift aided uh, 1.3 million to Quakers in Britain last year, and we were at four, a four point, nearly five million pound business. And since the company was created, we've gifted over six million pounds to Quakers in Britain. And that doesn't include all of the costs of the pay, running the building at Friends House, which also massively comes, we pick up that as well. So, and it's, I, when I looked at it, it was quite gobsmacked. I've been with the, I've been 12 years and 38 million is a big business, a big Quaker business. But I think it's really important to remember why, so we, what do you do with all that money? You know, so yes, it gets gift aided back. But what I also believe is before we gift aid back, what we should be doing is looking about that community. And for many of you may know, we'll be running a, we've been running a uh, program with ex-offenders called Bake the Difference. Um, we didn't decide to work with the easiest group of ex-offenders. We had decided we we're going to work most challenging are those with mental health um, and all those that have been long service, mostly lifers who would never probably have ever been able to be given an opportunity to um, work in the community because of, because of their offences um, and people maybe not trusting them. So we decided that we were going to run a Bake the Difference. We sort of pilot with working with a, a hostel called um, uh, up in, in London. Uh, and um, we realised that actually baking was key to therapeutic help and getting them back in integrated um, and the program was running until the pandemic we were just about to start our, our U2 program um, and but what the outcomes we had realized from the year one program was that none of the none of the none of the offenders had actually trainees had actually re-offended not for their original uh, offense some did get uh, returned to uh, to her majesty's pleasure but it was mostly to protect them in tech, protect them in terms of other different uh, um, uh, social abuses, uh, drugs, alcohol, which were, were violated their parole. Uh, but on the whole, none of them actually reoffended on any of their offences. And there's what we found from the uh, feedback from there was that their self-esteem and mental health really greatly improved. 
So we primarily fund this. This is taken out of the gift aid. The shareholder, for nearly meeting, agreed that we could take some out of the, take some out of the gift aid to support this, and we support it by about seventy thousand pound a year. And we work in partnership with London Pathways. Um, and we also received two grants, and we're looking for more grants as and when the uh, program starts up again. Just a few figures, 100 different items of food produced, the trade needs to do over 300 hours of learnings. It wasn't just, it was about learning. Um, and we had 10 trainees enrolled on the programme and over 400 friends tasted their works at last year's yearly meeting in 2019 because um, they put on a great display of, just, uh, of, in the, of, of the evening of the group fair. Just let you read that quickly. This is what it meant to them. And I, when we read some of the others, and there's a lot more, uh, I have to say both my, my senior team and I had a few tears in our eyes because it actually meant that we were giving back and they were actually benefiting from what we were doing. And it's a whole team event. It's, it, was, it was devised and thought through by the staff uh, and they delivered it all the way. But it's also about being an ethical employer and empowering staff. And I merely will talk a bit more as we go along through that. So I'm like every other company, this is about making sure our staff are accredited, what we do, the diversity of our staff. And we actually report our diversity. We, we have come every year on our annual report. We don't have to, but we've decided to start talking about gender pay gap diversity because we want to show that we as an ethical business um, are really in thinking about all these things. We pay a one to four ratio, which is unusual, particularly for the hospitality industry, and it has its challenges, I'm particularly now in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and we pay above the London living wage, um, and let's say we report on our mean, uh, our mean gender pay gap. But also what's really important, we encourage our staff to volunteer. Um, we pay five days that they could go and do volunteering. Um, and a lot of staff have been out and volunteered on all sorts of projects in London, which is all about, giving back to that community and it, and it, and it makes for, for staff uh, involvement in everything. And they arranged um, food bank donations and they came up with a suspended soup scheme, which allows us to give soup to anybody, um, like a pay forward um, with a coffee, but it's actually with soup. Um, and all the staff get involved with that as well. And we're thinking about that at the moment in the pandemic, what could we be doing now as winter starts again, um, even though we're, we're in lockdown. <clears throat> Just before, as many of you know, just last year, we put our, 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 our values into action and said, actually, we should stop serving meat and fish and all these other things. And let's get back to what the real principles. And we opened up our eco-friendly restaurant called The Sea Kitchen. Um, and it was doing extremely well um, before the pandemic. 100% um, vegetarian and vegan. 71% um, of the ingredients were from UK supply. And 22 of them percent of those were within food miles of the home county. So we were really thinking about developing a menu that was not just sustainable, but also it had an impact on uh, on, on impact as well. And again, help the difference. The, the difference trainees were getting involved in the dessert making uh, and gaining experience at the barista. That was the second part of the thing. So it's all obviously going to be rethought through at the moment um, as we hit the sort of pandemic. So those in business, how many of you had um, on your risk registers pandemic? Because I didn't. I didn't have pandemic. I didn't even think a pandemic. And here we are. I had Brexit and now I've got pandemic. And what does it mean when it comes to our values, particularly in these really, really difficult times? Um, I think this is really when our values come to the forefront about and about our business method of taking time to discern and think things through, not to rush, but to think what is needed for everybody. So really our decision has enabled us to make, I think, hopefully to make the right decisions. Um, some of you have seen me making some very passionate email of uh, passionate videos about particularly our industry. It is devastated at the moment, uh, particularly the events, uh, hospitality, we have been the forgotten trade um, and haven't really opened uh, at all. Um, but we've tried to be truthful, transparent and honest in everything we've been trying to tell our customers and also to our staff. 
So what we've done with the staff, we have topped everybody up, up to the government limit to 100%, uh, up to 2,500. And there have been some staff that have had to go on to furlough and have had to lose some money. Um, we've proposed a voluntary redundancy scheme. Um, I have 74 staff, 26 staff have just taken voluntary redundancy. Their gift of taking that will help others survive. We will come through this, but we needed to review, review and reduce our cost base. Staff have had the opportunity to take up resilience training, wellness and online training, because we recognize that even myself, this isn't my natural place to be in my home. I'm a people person. I want to be with people. So being first of that, being trapped in that first lockdown, everybody felt very isolated. So we made sure that we've been spending lots of time making people like me, including me, resilient by offering online training and setting up lots of furlough chats for non-staff staff and quiz nights, all the things that we could do. And I think at the moment, because we thought everybody was going to come back, morale has hit all time low. So we're going to have to work even harder now between now and Christmas and to the new year to build up that 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 sense of being. And, and we'll talk about how we're going to do that at the end. In terms of our customers, we have think we have led the way, particularly in hospitality. We were on the front foot. We created a COVID centre. We told our customers exactly what we were going to do and how we were going to make it safe. We have been running businesses, um, meetings up to 30 people, and we've had fantastic response from the NHS. Um, remember, we are, we, our key market is the third sector, second sector. We very don't very do corporate work. So those sort of customers are all the sort of customers that would look for our sake, want us to be really safe. Been offering flexibility and cancelling, postponing events. And currently, we're looking to see if we could do some sort of COVID guarantee that if you book something you could get, you could cancel within three to four days. A bit like some of the travel agencies are doing. But it is, it is it is risky. But I think actually, at times like this, we need to take risk, but we need to make sure it's grounded in thinking before we rush and make decision making. So I think we're looking ahead to a different era. Um, and I think the road to recovery could look like this. And this is Swarthmore Hall. Go the other week with a lovely rainbow going across, across it because Swarthmore Hall has also been quite devastated. But actually, we, we've done self-catering. We found ways of doing different things that will allow us to keep people occupied, to keep the income. Of course, it's not its charitable purpose to do self-accommodation. It's a, it's a centre for learning and centre for people to to go on pilgrimages, but at the moment we can't do that. So what could we do that allows some income to come in and allow staff to feel that valued in what they're doing? So we're looking at more T's and C's, more flexible ways um, and how buying behaviours are changing. So we're looking to see how that works. Um, and we're looking at ways to, to explore new revenues. Um, and of course, I think we really key here about investing in our people. Um, because we want them to be part of the new transformation. It'd be very easy for me just to say, well, I think we should do this. But actually, I need it to grow, be rooted from both our values, but rooted through our staff into what we all do together. So in the next couple of weeks, months, I'm going to be doing a series of uh, workshops with the staff, going back, maybe using the action learning as a, as a, as a tool. We know what the problem is. What questions do we need to be asking ourselves about how can we do re-diversify ourselves? What could we do differently to meet the new need? Um, as we certainly, I can't see the industry pulling back out of this, probably till next March and early into next year. So we've got quite a lot of time to think about what we've got to do. But staff are key to the decision making. So I'm going to go back to those three Ps and everything that we do needs to value those three Ps. The profit is important because obviously we've got we need to be profitable. Um, trading charities cannot prop up trading arms. But we need to think about the other two things rather than making decisions that would affect the other two. Easy slash cost slash staff slash. But they're not the things that we should be doing. The things we should be doing at the moment is investing for the future. In times of trouble, think about investing. And I think we have a we have a wealth of experience um, that we could probably also offer to others. And we've never done consultancy. And I think there's a possibility we have lots of other organisations out there who are also in the same. And I think we could use some of our some of our helping hands to help others do through this 
Um, so we may well look to see if we can offer other faith-led businesses some of our experience. So rebranding ourselves into doing something slightly differently. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish it on another. I think we need to think that the, the key theme themes here, friends, is I think we need to do things differently. We need to reinvent ourselves, and I think we need to do, we need, but not at the expense of the three Ps. Um, I think we will get through this, um, but I think the key here is George Fox's words really resonating in my head: "Be patterns, be examples." And I think as Quakers, we Quaker-led businesses, we've got all those principles to be able to help others uh, and lead us through. So thank you, friends, for inviting me. That was a whistle stop tour, and I hope I'm about the right time. Um, and if not, um, I'm happy to take some questions. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Paul. That feels like you really sort of brought us up to date on exactly what you in particular as a, as a, as a business and a Quaker business are facing at the moment. I think that, that the perspective you brought in about your response to the pandemic is really valuable in particular right now. It's like another P in the in that list of P's, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. We, does a, we are a little ahead of time, actually. I think, Paul, you, you have used your time very well, but we actually started a little early with you. So, right. <laughs> so if anyone has an, any immediate questions for Paul, we could take those now. Stuart, put his hand up first. OK, thanks, Wendry. Paul, thank you very much indeed, and thanks for getting us started this morning. What a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I've got loads of questions, but I'm going to just off one for simplicity uh, and I was quite fascinated about profit being purpose or that interpretation of it uh, which can kind of fly in the face of some of the other schools which is the the, the purpose of his business is to be to bring to market a service or a good as a genuine requirement so you've got quite quite a difference there so I guess a question for me would be around that which is how do you decide what appropriate level of profit then Paul it's a very good. It's a, it's a very good question, um, and I think I think the key is you you need to decide. What, well, I think I, it's been my case. The shareholder would, would like like the re best return on their investment, um, and but I don't think I would to decide to take bring a product product a product to market. I think that was in in conflict with the other two just to make more money. So I think that's the key. So I wouldn't decide to open, take on another organisation or something that I felt wasn't in, didn't meet those other two criteria. So those balancing that criteria, and that might also be to with particularly with us a customer. It might be very easy for me to take on a customer, but I just know that that customer wouldn't sit right with our values. Um, and probably the values of Quakers in Britain. So I have to always constantly balance. Of course, I want to make more money. But I also need to be balanced. And, it, and it's tricky. It's, it's tricky. I'll be honest. You know, when I look at our cost base and I talk about going to market, I would have a real difficulty going to market because my cost base, because I pay a one to four ratio, would disadvantage me going to a cost base to, to, to go and deliver something for somebody else. Because actually, what our values of paying people won't, the, the profit margin gets reduced. And as we all know in hospitality, it's cutthroat. So there, there are those tensions. And, and believe me, at the moment, I'm looking at all of those things to work out how we what, what is the best thing to do going forward. But yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you. I hope I've answered that. May, may I come back, Wendry? Chaney? Um, can you, any longer conversations are available this afternoon. Um, everyone gets one and then we'll go on. So the next person is Keith. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm puzzled about this this point about profit um, as, as well. Um, if um, if selling chocolate hadn't been profitable, we wouldn't have Woodbrook. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> why are we so embarrassed about profit? Uh, I'm 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 very fond of um, Peter Drucker's observation that kind of profit is the air that businesses breathe. It's the food that they eat. If they don't get it, they die. Uh, but it's not I'm all right. the yeah, purpose well. is not to maximise profit. Um, uh, the the purpose is to do is to organise people together to do good and valuable things. But if it is not profitable, you will not be able to continue to do it beyond 
uh, the time when you've you've burned up all your initial capitals. So how how did we end up being quite so embarrassed about profit? Do you think? I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I'm interesting that, but I think even in the days of the Cadbury's and the Roundtrees, I think that they still had the local meeting. Um, they still had to take their accounts, I believe, to the local area meeting for scrutiny. So I think even then um, there was a worry about the level of profit. Um, so, but I, I, I do, I think what friends don't realise is you're not in business if you're not in profit. You ain't a business, you're not in business. So, and I think it's about the level and I think it's about how you make it that's the key. And I think that's what some of maybe where some of the ethical bit, we need to really show that ethical, to make money ethically is okay, but it's the ethics of how you make the money. And I think Quakers have got the, that space really, but I think some friends still don't trust those probably maybe some of those principles and then maybe that's possibly and I'm not a Quaker I'm looking at that from an outside point of view but I think it would be great discussion maybe later this afternoon to keep those discussions going because I think as a group we've got to to realize that actually profit is important but it's how you make it okay thank you for that um Lorna was the next one uh, that was great. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've got a question. You talked um, about how you managed your staff during, you know, with the, with the pandemic. Um, and I presume that means uh, employees. Do you have any contract staff? And if you do, how have you managed your relationship with them during the pandemic? So where we had relationships with a third party agency for staff, um, we made sure that the agency, well, well first of all, we were not, weren't sure what was going to happen. And once we realised that we could furlough them, we un we wrote to the agencies and said we would underpin this up to the eighty percent. So we get, we we believed it was important that everybody should be treated the same. So um, we took that decision. Um, obviously, goods and services we we can we haven't cut any of the services. We we have had to re just recently have had to to with one supplier um security because there is you know we we I've, I've got to be able to reduce my core costs but we've done it in the most breath way and we said if, if we come back from this then we would obviously come back and have that relationship again it's all about being honest and open with people um but all of most of our contracts are still in place we've just worked with them to be able to reduce the cost base um, but i know lots of other hospitality companies who have have third party contractors have just cancelled their contracts because they they I, I all our staff are on our payroll and therefore are our risk many other organizations many other charities that run trading arms um outsource all of it to other companies and have maybe taken the same right choices that we have but everybody's in this differently so but yes we have um tried our best <laughs> thank you Okay, and the next person with their hand up is Gordon. Oh, hello, Paul. Um, brilliant to hear the word profit in a Quaker context. It's been, been pissing me off for decades, but never mind. What I really want to talk to you about is uh, professional recognition within the hospitality trade. That uh, it's notorious for short term working, poor pay, poor, no recognition in this country uh, compared, for instance, with the, with the continent to some extent. Uh, I speak from personal experience, second-hand personal experience, because my son is, or rather was, given the current situation, a waiter, and he has just celebrated 20 years as a waiter. But he gets virtually no recognition out there for the skills that he has acquired over that over that time. Uh, I have, to, yeah. I think uh, this is you're on my hobby horse now. I do believe that uh, our, uh, we we live in Victorian times. I think, friends, sometimes when it comes to hospitality staff, and we don't recognise the value of what they do and what they bring to to the professionalism. And I'm absolutely right. So for for what we try to do is to make sure, where possible, to make sure that we accreditate staff as best we can with giving them the qualifications that they need. Uh, plus also we want to professionalize us as an organization. So be, being members of the MIA, we're having a silver accreditation uh, and getting us uh, high profiling the best we can. Um, but I think it's there's a stigma still about working in our industry. And I, and I don't, I mean, 
I, you know, I came from a privileged background. I had a private education, but I've worked, I've worked, started up as a trainee chef and I've worked my way up through the career to be why, and I'm absolutely passionate about this is the best place for young people to work. So when we come out the other end of this, I've gone to absolutely put on our thing that we need to help the young back into, but we've got to make it look attractive and we've got to pay them properly. Um, and we've got to recognize them for their professionalism. So thank you, yes. Thank you. Thank you.